I'm Mark Golub, and in the news, a range of critical issues, including North Korea's nuclear saber rattling, U.S. Soviet relations in the aftermath of America's Tomahawk missile strike against Syria, the upcoming French elections, and what might they signal for the future viability of the European Union, and of course, the ongoing criticism of Israel, especially Israel's settlement policy. Well, what better person to speak to the sweep of issues confronting us than the man who many regard as the most brilliant and insightful columnist in America today, Brett Stevens, who joins us now on our JBS phones. Brett, it is wonderful having you back with us once again. Thanks for having me on the show, Mark. So, Brett... Um, before we look at some of the critical issues of the day, the reality is you've made news as well. And while I don't want to belabor this as, at all, I should ask you, uh, you're leaving the Wall Street Journal after a, you know, some 20-year career there. You're moving over to the New York Times. Brett, there are some who absolutely adore you and have been adoring you for the last 20 years who feel that you are the most... Uh, eloquent conservative voice on the American scene and all they want to say is Brett say it isn't so so you have to explain to us what prompted you to make this move well the venue changes but my views do not um, and uh, as you said I've been at the journal for uh, nearly 20 years I joined uh, uh, in my uh, mid-20s um, in uh, 19, uh, 1998. It's a wonderful newspaper uh, with a great editorial page. Um, but uh, after 20 years, uh, you know, a man wants to kind of stretch his legs. Um, and in my case, it meant uh, walking about eight blocks south and uh, <laughs> uh, roughly two blocks west. Very good. By the way, Brett, does it have anything to do with the election of Donald Trump? No, uh, it's just a, it was just a personal decision to, um, uh, you know, that, uh, <laughs> uh, look, it's now uh, considered a miraculous when someone stays in a job for five years Absolutely. or ten years. Right. Um, I was in the same place for, for about 20, and it was, um, I just felt it was time for, uh, 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 a, a time for a change, a time to kind of refresh my batteries, maybe speak to a different audience than yes. the one that uh, I had a chance to address at the, uh, at the Wall Street Journal. Um, maybe an audience that um, uh, could, uh, uh, you know, use a, a wider perspective or a different perspective. And so um, here I am, as someone said. Okay. By the way, it is good to hear, I think people will be very happy to hear, it does not reflect a change of view. It's a change of platform, of venue, but um, it's interesting. Uh, the only thing that's changing is the font, okay? Um, <laughs> uh, my, my opinions uh, are, oh, my. you know, I was, I was hired uh, uh, because of my uh, generally conservative um, outlook, and uh, um, none of that is uh, different uh, today than it was um, just last week when I wrote a scathing column about uh, um, the consequences of um, Obama's uh, dishonesty in Syria. Um, so just, uh, I guess all I can say is um, I'm the same guy uh, that I've been for some time. Well, it's wonderful. And the only other question I have uh, on this topic, and then I want to move off, you had a very significant role in the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal. I'm assuming you wouldn't have taken this job if you weren't given absolute latitude to write whatever you wanted to. But I'm also assuming you're not part of the editorial page. Am I wrong? Uh, well, I am part of the editorial page. I'm a columnist. Yes, but um, I mean, you're not... But, uh, I'm, my, my, the ambit of my responsibility runs from uh, the first word of my column to the last. Very good. And uh, I'll be involved in various ways in, in some of the work of the Times. And look, you know, the Times, I think... Uh, by hiring me, demonstrated that it, it too, wants to um, uh, look for a, a wider audience. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And uh, so I think it's, um, I mean, it's somewhat uh, perhaps presumptuous of me to say, but I think it's a great credit to the Times that, um, you know, they're, they're, they're looking to broaden their horizons uh, beyond what uh, perhaps um, 
uh, the readers were uh, previously accustomed to. Okay. And, uh, you know, the, look, the Times is, is uh, one of the, if not the great, um, journalistic institution in the world. And um, I think it's, it's good that they're going to have a, a voice on their editorial pages that's uh, perhaps a little different from what some of their readers are, um, um, are accustomed to. I think it's fabulous. It's very flattering to you. And I've told you both personally, and I've said it multiple times here on JBS, I believe you are the most balanced, intelligent, insightful analyst on the American scene today in any media. I wish you only the best in this next exciting chapter of your life, in which I have no doubt you will do only what you've been doing you know for your entire career and that's educating us and enlightening us and forcing us to take more uh, careful looks at the world around us and uh, I'm very happy for you well thanks Mark I, I really appreciate that and um, so anyway what, what should we talk about today well let's begin with Donald Trump and uh, you know Brett you were a fierce critic of both the candidacy of Donald Trump in the Republican primaries and also in the general election. I heard you say that you hoped he did not win a single electoral vote. At the same yep. time, you've been very critical of President Obama's foreign policy. You wrote a superb book on the subject, America in Retreat, the New Isolationism and the Coming Global Order. How disorder. do you, how, yes, disorder, I'm sorry. How do you evaluate Donald Trump's decision both the decision-making process and the decision itself to strike Assad after he used sarin gas. Well, it was the right decision, and I said so in my um, in my last column for uh, the journal. Uh, Obama struck a terrible bargain with Assad in 2013, um, which uh, didn't even achieve what it um, uh, claimed to achieve. And to make matters worse, uh, the Obama administration continued to uh, mislead the American public about the quality of Syrian compliance, even as it was becoming abundantly clear that the Assad regime was cheating. So the wanton murder of um, Syrian civilians using sarin gas once again uh, required a, a, a response. And um, uh, I know some people said, well, uh, Obama would have conducted the same response. I'm not so sure. I think one of the things that it illustrates is the influence of General McMaster in, um, uh, in the White House. Uh, General McMaster, the National Security Advisor, is someone I praised the moment he was um, appointed. Yes. Someone who understands, uh, I think, better than perhaps other people in the administration, uh, what a dangerous uh, man Assad is and, and how um, uh, antithetical his continuance in office is to core American interests in uh, the Middle East. Um, look, I, uh, I was, a, as you said, a, a ferocious critic of Trump. Um, I don't want the Trump presidency to fail because I want, uh, you know, I, I want it to, I, I, I would rather eat crow than watch the presidency fail the way I, I fear um, it might. And when, he's, and when, and when the administration uh, takes the right decisions, I'm going to say so. It, it just, that strikes me as, um, uh, the uh, the appropriate way of um, responding. Yes. Um, uh, on the other hand, you know, look, uh, Assad's chemical strike happened literally days after um, Nikki Haley, who's I think someone who is uh, doing well in her job as UN ambassador, and uh, Rex Tillerson, Secretary of State, had uh, publicly indicated that regime change was no longer uh, it sort of um, a priority for uh, the Trump administration. And I think uh, Assad looked at that uh, statement um, somewhat in the way that uh, Kim Il-sung did in 1950 when Dean Acheson had uh, foolishly suggested that the U.S. wouldn't come to the aid of South Korea in the event of a North Korean invasion. It just means you have to be very careful when you're in a position like that about making statements that... Um, uh, will entice um, ambitious dictators to uh, provocative behavior. Yes. I yeah. think the administration learned its lesson, and I think uh, it's now trying uh, not to repeat similar mistakes in places like North Korea. Mm -hmm. 
Brett, are you worried about, at all about any escalation in terms of the conflict with Vladimir Putin's Russia because of the strike in Syria? Well, I think, um, you know, one of, the, um, one of the tragedies of the Obama administration is that the, Obama's cons the President Obama's uh, frequent refusal to back up his uh, eloquent words with any kind of serious action uh, persuaded people like Vladimir Putin or Bashar Assad or Ali Khamenei in Iran that um, the U.S. was a paper tiger and persuaded them that in the event of a confrontation, the U.S. would always back down, which I think explains why we are now dealing with this world of crisis from uh, you know, North Korea to Syria and, and, uh, and perhaps Eastern Europe. So the, the um, you know Putin may be under the mis may be under the impression that in uh, Donald Trump he has someone very much like um, his predecessor. Ironically, for all the flack she uh, she took, um, Hillary Clinton was broadly speaking more hawkish when it came to Putin, um, uh, and and uh, and privately more hawkish when it came to uh, Assad. Than Donald Trump was. So what what Trump is doing, in his own way, is moving somewhat closer to the position of his um, of his opponent in last year's election. Mm -hmm. All right, talk to me now a moment about North Korea. Brett, for the past eight years, we've been told that the single greatest threat to world stability was Iran's quest for a nuclear weapon, and that nothing was more important to American military security than preventing Iran from ever having nuclear weapon capability. We knew that North Korea already developed nuclear weapons and that it was developing missiles that could deliver nuclear warheads against other nations. But now suddenly, Brett, no one's talking about Iran. Everyone's talking about North Korea. Why were we not talking about North Korea for the last 10 years? Well, I was talking about North Korea for the last 10 years. So um, what's, as, uh, as, as the joke goes, what's this, what's this we stuff, you know, Lone Ranger? Um, uh, uh, you know, um, but you know what I mean. The truth is, Mark, that the problem of North Korea and the problem of Iran is linked. It's linked in a number of ways, not the least of which is that we know that there is significant technological sharing between these two uh, regimes. Uh, we know that North Korean scientists are present in Iran, and uh, there are suspicions that Iranians may have at least been present during some of North Korea's um, six, I think, five or six nuclear detonations uh, to date. Um, and we know that North Korea helped build a nuclear reactor in Syria, of course, uh, Syria, a client state of Iran, before Israel destroyed it uh, a decade ago. So there we, 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 we know or should know that there is a large subterranean um, nuclear complex which links um, dangerous regimes uh, together. Um, you know, North Korea illustrates, the, uh, the history of our dealings with North Korea, I think, illustrates and reminds us of why um, our negotiation with Iran is, um, was so misguided and mm -hmm. is so dangerous. Yes. In 1994, President Clinton, uh, thanks to the intercession of President Carter, arranged this deal with North Korea, in which we were supposed to offer North Korea economic benefits. Yes in exchange for promises from them that they would not seek to develop a nuclear capability. Um, this was called the Yongbyon uh, Agreed Framework. And if you go back to statements President Clinton made uh, at the time of the agreement, he said this, this agreement is going to strengthen verification procedures. This agreement is going to make the world safer. We know now perfectly well that North Korea never abided by the terms of the agreement, that they pocketed the concessions while not honoring their side of the bargain, and that they continued to develop a nuclear capability, which they brought to fruition in 2006. So what, what we bought in 1994 wasn't uh, peace in our time. It was uh, the illusion of peace in our time, which has led to the crisis we have today. All of those elements are present 
in the deal that President Obama and his cohorts uh, struck with Iran, and I think they're going to have exactly the same result. Very interesting. Um, you know, you, when you talk about the link between Iran and North Korea, I understand what you've been saying, but Brett, I don't hear that said by anyone in the administration. I haven't heard the word Iran come out of Pence's mouth. I haven't heard the word Iran come out of Trump's mouth unless he's telling us how bad the Iran deal was. And you're saying the two are vitally linked. Do you understand why it, it both surprises me and also upsets, it worries me, that you have been saying, look at these two programs that are interlocked. But when this is presented to the American people by our administration, by Obama and by Trump, your point is not being made. Well, you know, part of the, you know, one of the funny aspects about the Trump administration is, you know, here is an administration that um, presumably uh, knows how to operate, if, you know, solid businesses. Um, and that was, I think, one of the promises of the Trump presidency, that the quality of management would improve under President Trump. But what we have now is um, an overwhelming majority of key positions in government uh, not only haven't been filled, people haven't been named for those positions. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, a kind of a um, nobody's home syndrome right now in the United States government. You know, I, it's perfectly fair to make the case that government is bloated and government is expensive, but um, government has to be staffed at least at the top levels in order to be uh, effective. Um, you know, if you read the Federalist Papers, one of the things that Alexander Hamilton keeps talking about is the need for effective government. And that means having uh, people in place who can staff, or excuse me, who can properly brief decision makers like Pence and, uh, and the president, of course, President Trump, um, and who can execute policy without, you know, direct orders from the president. I mean, even if you have a kind of a well-versed policy wonk in the White House right now, he would be overwhelmed because there, there's just nobody there. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, this failure to kind of discuss the linkages between uh, North Korea and, um, and Iran, much less kind of the broader uh, kind of ideological lesson that regimes that uh, don't um, care about the welfare of their own people are going to be indifferent to the welfare or the interests of their neighbors, uh, that's that's a real you know that's a real issue here, and yes. I, I know that people kept saying, well, Hillary was going to be worse, and Hillary was going to be worse. But I somehow doubt that a um, uh, hundred days into a Hillary administration, we would have so many senior senior positions just completely unfilled because no one has bothered to name name people to these jobs. We're just now getting deputy secretaries of state and defense. It's mm -hmm. just incredible. Mm -hmm. You mentioned again the Iran deal. You know, we were told by Secretary Kerry, by Susan Rice, by President Obama himself, that they had worked out a very a successful, they had negotiated a successful deal to get all of the chemical weapons out of Syria, that they had accomplished that. And then we see Assad using sarin gas again. It makes everybody wonder whether they were telling us the truth or whether they understood the truth. And then people ask if they were not right about Syria and chemical weapons there, how should we feel about the Iran deal? So I'm asking you in general, at this point in time, Brett, how do you feel about the Iran deal? Well, I think the Iran deal was a terrible deal um, that, as I mentioned earlier, creates an illusion of safety, but is going to create a not only... Um, it not only creates opportunities for Iran to cheat and to hold uh, to hold the uh, the world hostage as it uh, violates uh, violates terms of the deal sort of at the margins uh, um, uh, incrementally, uh, but it's uh, at the end of its term it creates a legal pathway by it creates a legal pathway for uh, uh, for Iran to acquire all the elements it needs. Um, to rapidly produce um, nuclear weapons. Um, you know, 
one, one of the things I pointed out in my column last week, uh, Mark, is that it wasn't simply that um, the Obama administration arranged this deal with Syria and woe betide, you know, it turned out that, the, that Assad was cheating. They knew Assad was cheating, and yet they continued to claim year in and year out that the deal was a success. And the reason they did so is they wanted to demonstrate that you could negotiate with dictators to get them to voluntarily give up their weapons of mass uh, destruction. And that was a false narrative, which they, Susan Rice and John Kerry and President Obama knowingly peddled. Um, and, they, and I say knowingly because they knew that the Syrians were cheating, and yet they kept saying and that the Syrians had retained sarin gas and other prohibited chemicals, and yet they kept saying that the Syrians had complied 100% and given up all of their, all of their weapons. Um, so, you know, that just laid a predicate in which we were going to strike these, these bogus bargains with, um, with rogue dictators, and we were going to pretend that uh, they had given everything up. They would pretend... And you'd kind of postpone things until a future administration when a crisis would blow up. And I don't think that's a way of conducting um, um, serious, um, serious foreign policy. Brett, to the extent that you are describing the situation accurately, it is outrageous. Don't you feel it is outrageous for an administration to do something like that? Yes, outrageous. and I said so. Actually, I was on Charlie Rose last week. I commend my exchange with uh, Tony Blinken to your attention. Uh, Blinken was Deputy Secretary of State during the Obama administration. And I find it kind of weird that people like Blinken and even John Kerry are applauding um, Trump's strike on Syria, uh, which um, is exactly what Obama refused to do under very similar circumstances back in, uh, back in 2013. You know, uh, Mr. Blinken took umbrage at my suggestion that this was mendacity. <laughs> but you had the front page of the Wall Street Journal as far back as 2015 saying the Syrians retain stockpiles of prohibited chemical weapons. We had uh, Mr. Clapper, James Clapper, the head of uh, uh, national, uh, director of national intelligence, telling Congress that they had uh, retained um, prohibited chemical weapons, and yet as recently as this January, just before the administration left office, uh, Susan Rice, the national security advisor, was insisting in public that we got all the chemical weapons out. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't understand under how it's possible um, that she could, as national security advisor, could make that claim with a straight face, because mm -hmm. she knew perfectly well that the Syrians were cheating. Mm -hmm. By the way, Brett, have you seen any evidence that whatever the Russians tried to do in terms of having an influence or impact on the American election, have you seen any, any evidence that they were successful in influencing our election in any way? Well, they've been abundantly successful. They've cast serious doubts in a large, in the minds of many people in the public, that the election was tampered with. Um, that it, that, that um, there was meddling, and I think that's exactly. What they were what they were going for, Mark. It wasn't to it wasn't to, you know, actually switch the ballots. It was to sow confusion about the legitimacy of those ballots, um, and that's exactly what they've done um, uh, elsewhere in in the world. Mm -hmm. um, it was there's no question that they intervened in a U.S. election. So leaving aside, you know, we can we can have a, a, a discussion about the efficacy of their intervention. But they intervened in a sovereign uh, American election. I think they were trying to make mischief, and they were trying to promote a narrative which is present in the Russian media that Western democracy is basically fake democracy, and mm -hmm. therefore uh, no different fundamentally from so-called Russian democracy. Okay. Uh, and I think to, to some, I mean, to the extent that to this day we are discussing this quite seriously, and that there are. Uh, congressional investigations, and that there's real doubt on, in, the, in the minds, and by the way, sincere and, and, and substantial doubt, in, substantial in the sense that there's substance to it, in the minds of millions of Americans about um, the, uh, the uh, foreign intervention or foreign interference in the election, that's just the aim, that's just what they were going for, and they mm -hmm. got it. Okay, we're and, about... And by the way, 
the only response to that ought to be uh, some form of serious punishment to the Russian regime so that they never repeat that exercise. Mm -hmm. One way of doing it is to start seizing assets um, or exposing assets of ill-gotten Russian gains in places like uh, London and Cyprus and uh, bank accounts around the world. Mm -hmm. We're about to see another election in France, Brett. There are some who are worried it will skew far right, it will skew populist, <coughs> and that the EU is in jeopardy. As you look at the French election, what's your feeling? Well, it's extremely, uh, I'm extremely nervous about it, no question. Uh, uh, right now, last I checked, a third of French voters were undecided. And by the way, it's not just a far right, a p the potential for a far right skew. There's also potential for a far left skew um, if uh, the two candidates of the far left, the socialist uh, Hamon and uh, Mr. Mélenchon, uh, join forces. So what's really being squeezed out is uh, the middle. Uh, uh, Mrs. Le Pen, I think, let the mask slip on uh, what her party's all about. Yes. She denied French complicity in the Holocaust, in the, in the Velle de Yves uh, um, roundup of, uh, of, of Jews during the Vichy government, um, uh, you know, which was a reminder that you know, the, the fruit doesn't fall very far from the tree. Her, her father, the founder of the party she leads, uh, is notorious for calling the Holocaust a detail of history. Mm -hmm. And uh, should she win... Um, that's going to be a tragedy for Western civilization, not just a tragedy for France, not simply because the, the policies that she espouses would be catastrophic for France, for the French economy. Um, it would probably lead to the end of the European Union, which, for all of its flaws, is, um, has brought huge benefits to Europe and has been, I think, generally an expression of terrific human optimism. There's a lot still going for uh, the EU, as much as I've criticized uh, some of its policies. Um, but it's also an open intervention for, or an open invitation for further Russian intervention in European politics for, uh, for, and for um, pushing the United States out of Europe. And to the extent that the U.S. is not a part of European politics as it has been since 1945, the world becomes a more dangerous place. Very interesting analysis. It helps us as we watch these elections. Okay, finally, Brett, ever since UN Security Resolution 2334 branded every Israeli community east of the Green Line as a flagrant violation of international law, and we're talking here about Efrat, Malay Adumim, as well as Jewish communities in East Jerusalem, Gilo, French Hill, and the Old City of Jerusalem, and the Western Wall, Going to the UN Security Council, all of them are illegal ever since the Obama administration permitted that what is now an infamous resolution to be passed. Israel has taken enormous heat for its settlement policy and for its decision to build a new community on the West Bank. How critical are you of Israeli settlement policy and this recent decision to build another settlement on the West Bank? Look, I, I, my. my... I've said this before. I really wish settlements were the problem between Israel and the Palestinians. Yes. Because if that were true, then I'd have no problem urging the dismantling of the settlements. If, if you were to tell me, you know, uh, or if a, a voice from on high were to say, Stevens, you know, give up those settlements and Israel is going to have peace for the next hundred years, I'd say give up the settlements. Of course. Um, uh, and I suspect most Israelis would. Of course. Uh, most Israelis would as well. The truth is that the settlements are simply not the core of the conflict. If they were, Gaza right now would be a little, um, you know, Singapore on the Mediterranean or an Abu Dhabi on the Mediterranean, not uh, a breeding ground for terrorism and for incessant uh, attacks on pre-1967 uh, uh, pre Israel. My, I, I wrote a column just a few weeks ago um, in the form of advice to Jared Kushner about, uh, you know, the way forward. And I think that the right, the right path is to find a way to, in effect, anesthetize uh, the, uh, the issue, the Palestinian issue, which is to say that to the extent that ordinary Palestinian life 
can be facilitated, and Israel and the U.S. and others can play a part in that, great. But the real drama in the Middle East today is the struggle between uh, moderate or modern states um, and uh, the fanatics, Shiite or Sunni, uh, who threaten the, the moderates and, and, and the modernizers. So, you know, my, uh, my advice to the Israelis is you know, Israel has legitimate rights to um, be in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, whatever, whatever terminology you prefer. Certainly legitimate rights to um, holy places, and, and there's nothing sacrosanct about the 1967 uh, line. My advice to the Israeli government was, is, is to do things slowly and carefully, because the real game in the Middle East really shouldn't be played out uh, in, uh, uh, in, its, in its backyard. The real game in the Middle East is the Iranian nuclear deal. It is, the, um, uh, it is finding a resolution to the uh, tragedy of uh, Syria. It is putting groups like Hezbollah and Hamas not only on the back foot, but finding ways to, uh, to defeat them. Um, and that's, that's, uh, that's the policy that the Israeli government um, should, should adopt. You know, I grew up in Mexico City, and so I know something about the history of, um, of New Spain. And one of the uh, pieces of advice that um, Spanish viceroys used to give their, um, their successors is um, do as little as possible and do it slowly. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that's sometimes, certainly in, in a situation that has no immediate or near-term or even middle-term remedy like the conflict between uh, Israel and the Palestinians, that's pretty, uh, that's pretty good advice. Yes. This is a, a, a drama that's lasted 70 years. Yes. It may last um, much, much longer, and the biggest mistake people can make is to race for the solution or race for a purported cure. We have 25 years of experience of um, purported cures always making things worse. Uh, between uh, Israel and its neighbors. Okay. I only want to ask you to comment on something I learned from you. You were the first person I ever heard frame the Israeli-Palestinian conflict on a two-state solution by saying, if the Palestinians were ever willing to live as Canada lives alongside uh, America, you, Brett Stevens, would be totally supportive of that two-state solution, and you believe that the vast majority of Israelis would also, if they believed it was going to be Canada, U.S., they would be in favor of this. I recently spoke with a senior member of the American diplomatic establishment who argued with me that only 50% of the Israeli people would support a two-state solution even if the Palestinians were prepared to act like Canada. I found that both disappointing and somewhat frightening that a person of such U.S. stature would believe that only 50% of Israelis would support such a two-state solution. I want your sense of that. Do, you said well, a I don't know who you spoke to, but it doesn't seem like someone who knows Israel particularly well, much less Israelis. Um, the overall, I was editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post, as you know, um, and uh, I am, uh, uh, Israel remains a, a large part of my life. I know Israelis left, right, and center, politically speaking. And, um, you know, to me, the Israeli mind is all we want to do is get on with our lives, with our state, uh, without um, someone threatening our um, everyday or our national existence. Um, I mean, look, the Israelis were prepared to give up the, uh, give up the territories to, uh, to Yasser Arafat, a, um, an unreconstructed uh, terrorist in exchange for uh, promises of peace that, that I think you know the the, the the intervening years have shown have shown Israelis the, the the dangers of that. But the point is, if they were prepared to strike a deal with an Arafat or with someone like Mahmoud Abbas, uh, why wouldn't they be prepared to strike a deal if suddenly, by some miracle, you know Justin Trudeau uh, mm-hmm. were to become mm-hmm. uh, the head of the Palestinians and and Palestinians were to adopt the same sort of broadly Pacific easygoing attitudes that uh, uh, Canadians have. I just took my family on a vacation to Quebec City. It's a beautiful place. Uh, it's the shortest route to get to Europe, by the way, from, from uh, New, York, uh, New York City. Um, 
uh, and the food's better. Uh, but, uh, you know, there you are. You're in Canada, and, okay, it's French Canada. The language is slightly different. Um, but you feel you're in a free and modern society. <clears throat> and I think there's a kind of, uh, to borrow a phrase, a soft bigotry of low expectations when we say, oh, the Palestinians can never be like Canadians. You know, why not? Why not? In fact, there are many Palestinians who are Canadians um, and have adopted the culture and mores and political values of their, of their um, you know, of, of Canada, and so much the better. You have in the Arab world examples like Dubai or Abu Dhabi. Yes, they're, they're not perfect societies by uh, any stretch, but they're trying to, you know, move in a modern direction. They're trying to focus on on, on science and entrepreneurship and, uh, and progress rather than um, uh, obsess constantly about, uh, about national grievances um, or, um, you know, uh, adopt anti-Semitic tropes in their, um, in their uh, curricula, in their, in their, um, on, their, on their television, and so on. And people, I think, I think it would be great if an American president... Um, and the international community were to say to the Palestinians, hey, you know, we're reading what you're, what you're publishing. Um, we're, we're watching what you're teaching your kids. And that's, um, you know, as the saying is, that's not on. That's not mm-hmm. cool. Mm-hmm. And that has to change. You know, there are lots of stateless people around the world. Kurds want a state. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, the Corsicans sometimes want a state. I mean, all kinds of people you can, you can think of. Um, and... Uh, one ought to ask of the Palestinians, um, what exactly, you know, what are you doing to be worthy of statehood? Mm-hmm. What are you doing so that um, a Palestinian state doesn't instantly end up the way South Sudan has, to take, you know, the example of the most recent country to come into uh, existence, which in- has instantly fallen apart, and it's a good question whether the life of South Sudanese is any better now than it was 10 or 15, uh, uh, 10 or 15 years ago. So at a minimum, the international community ought to be insisting to the Palestinians, show us that you're ready to exercise responsibly um, the responsibilities of statehood. Live in peace with your neighbors. Treat your people with dignity and respect. Work towards a more um, liberal and democratic future. And if you're prepared to do that then, and, and demonstrate it over some period of time, then the whole world will walk uh, in hand with you towards the state, including the Israelis. Most of all, the Israelis, because I don't think most Israelis really, you know, want to spend their time worrying about whether they might not get stabbed on a bus or blown up in in, in a cafe because the politics of their neighbors um, uh, are uh, are 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 so in in so many respects so antediluvian um, compared to the liberal democracy that, that Israel has. Brett Stevens, you are out of this world. I can't thank you enough for giving me time and always sharing your wisdom with the JBS audience. You are a real, you're one of the loveliest guys I've ever met. I wish you the best of luck in all your work in this new chapter of your life. Have a great time and you will keep the readers you've had so far and you'll just get a whole new slew who will both love you, learn from you, and continued success in everything you do. And from time to time, you and I will speak. But I thank you, Brett, very, very much. Thanks, Mark. Uh, as you can tell, my views really haven't changed. They have not, and they're perfect. You be well, my right. best Thanks. to your family. Thank you, Brett. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Brett Stevens, who for more than 20 years, some 20 years, was a fixture at the Wall Street Journal. But as of May, Brett now will begin the next phase of his remarkable career with the New York Times. And again, all of us here at JBS wish him well in his new position. And I'm almost appreciative that Brett always gives us time here on JBS. As always, my thanks to our director, Sloan Copeland, Production Coordinator Serge Goldberg, to JBS's Associate Director Dara Golub, Editors Dennis Golden and John McDevitt, and to the producer of In the News, Carol Lilienthal. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends.